All right. Hello, we're here with Brandon Hershey. He's running for uh, Seattle School Board, a District 1, Position 7. Would you like to go ahead with your one-minute introduction? Yeah, absolutely. How's it going? Uh, my name is Brandon Hersey, like the candy bar without the second H, and I currently serve as Vice President of the Seattle School Board, seeking re-election after an appointment in 2019. Uh, I'm originally from Hattiesburg, Mississippi. Um, I am the son of an educator, the grandson of an educator, and my sister is currently a vice principal at the high school where my mom taught before she passed away. Uh, immediately after being appointed as the first African-American Truman Scholar from the University of Southern Mississippi, I got a job with the Obama administration in the Department of Health and Human Services and was really dissatisfied. Uh, here I was a young black man thinking I was going to go to one of the most progressive administrations in the history of our country, which it was, but my boss had been there since Reagan. And so I learned very quickly that there's a huge disconnect between the system that sets out to support our families and the actual resources that end up in the hands of our families. Thanks. And so for the past five years, I've been an educator in the Federal Way Public School District and just recently accepted a job as the political director for ProTech 17. Great. Thank you so much. All right. So now we'll move into the four prepared questions and I will place the first one into the chat. And if we could do this order, um, Mackenzie and then um, Ethan, Barbara and Andy. So Mackenzie. Your thing, uh, what policies will you seek to ensure that all students receive an education to reach their fullest potential? And what would you do to advance anti-racist and indigenous curriculum and promote racial equity in SPS? Yeah, absolutely. What a great question. So I'm going to talk kind of fast. If I need to slow down, just let me know. Um, first off, as a Black man and as a Black educator, I have seen firsthand what a really solid and effective school district and especially classroom can do for students. I can also see the trauma and harm that a really ineffective and violent environment can, can really uh, place onto our students as well. And so some of the pr policies that I'm really proud of that we've been able to pass in my short time on the board are a participatory budgeting initiative, which gives community control over an allotment of funds, as well as a resolution on Black student safety, which removed SEOs and SROs from our schools because I do not believe children need to be policed. I think that things can be diffused with words and not violence. Um, additionally to that, I've also, <clears throat> as a legislative agenda, opened up the legislative, <laughs> as a legislative liaison, opened up the legislative agenda for community impacts and feedback so that we can actually use our lobbyists down in Olympia to advance directly the needs uh, that families have told us that they want. I think moving forward, we're going to be uh, voting on a policy at our next board meeting that has been led by Director Rankin and I that bans isolation as a practice in our district uh, for disciplinary purposes, as well as puts heavy restrictions on uh, restraints that have been used against children. And so when you look at all of those things as a package, I think it paints a clear picture of my devotion to specifically uh, students of color and those furthest from educational justice. But what I think really also needs to be brought into this conversation is that even though we are focusing on those students, that does not excuse um, any type of educator or any person on our system uh, from not looking at our students from a position of low expectations. I think that what we really need to do is to prepare our students for whatever comes next post-graduation, whether it be college, the career, what have you. And I think that only when we do um, a good job of reaching our students and our families will we be able to fully understand what are the needs and what are the resources that they need in order to make whatever choice comes next for them. Um, that was a really quick way to put that. <laughs> so if I can expound on that later, please don't hesitate to ask. Great. Thank you so much. For sure. Uh, now we'll go into question two, and I believe that was Ethan. Yeah, uh, Brandon, what would you do to advocate for ample and equitable funding for K-12 education, including special education, school nurses, counselors, mental health professionals, and paraeducators? Um, and how would you ensure that students, educators, and schools are supported both with policy and funding? Yeah, absolutely. So as the chair of the Audit and Finance Committee, this is squarely in my jurisdiction and in my policy expertise. What I will say is that our way to staffing standards are archaic. And basically what that is, is the model that the state uses that gives us basically one uh, nurse for every 50,000 students. And so as you could imagine, that doesn't necessarily serve our needs for the present day educational landscape that we're in. I think some solutions there are A, being more, um, utilizing the resources that we 
we have better. And then also holding the state accountable for supporting us with special education. I think that what a lot of folks don't know is that families from all across the county will come to Seattle based on our special education services, which actually sends our the price that we pay for that sky high. So somewhere in the realm of, uh, we spend somewhere in the realm of $140 million a year on special education services. The state reimburses us for anywhere from 60 to 80 million of that. So the rest of that comes out of the general fund. We would literally not have a budget crisis if the state would just pay their fair share in terms of special education. I think that additionally, knowing that that is going to be a pipe dream <laughs> that we might not see in our lifetimes, I think that there are a lot of opportunities through our levy, through uh, working with the county and the city to take a look at the initiatives like restorative justice and things like that, that we are all really committed to and figuring out how can we pull resources and understanding and knowledge to make our dollars go further. I, I don't have to tell you that the relationship between the county, the city, and the school district has been very fraught over the years, but I'm really excited about the new class of elected officials, such as Council Member Zalahai, such as Council Member Lewis, and others who have come in, who we all have really great relationships with one another, and we partner on a regular basis. I think that those types of relationships moving forward are going to be critical for us to make sure that our money goes the distance. Um, but Advocacy is also a big part of that. And as a legislative liaison, ensuring, again, that community has input and say on what our priorities are in the legislature are critical. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, question number three, and I believe that was Barbara, if, if her connection. Yes. Right. There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I can hear you well. Yeah. Great, great. Um, what will you do to ensure the district accurately projects enrollment and school budgets for 2021-22? and in the future. Yeah, so here's, I love that question. So as a teacher, I can, I have seen firsthand that especially in South King County and especially for communities of color, we are very transient depending on where is the most affordable place to live. Uh, the vast majority of my former students in federal way are South Seattle residents that have been priced out due to gentrification. And so there's not really going to be a one size fits all answer to making sure that our enrollment projections are good. What I think could be different is communication with other school districts and understanding what are the patterns that enrollment are following, right? So I know that there is a grand shift south, especially for black and brown communities. And so what I also know is that as new apartment complexes open up that are more affordable with more MFTE units, specifically in the south end, those families tend to come back because this is the neighborhood where they grew up. So it's really kind of like a, you know, a seesaw or a swing or a pendulum or whatever the toy you want to insert there is. But what I think we don't do enough of is communicating with districts, especially in South King County, but additionally, making sure that we are planning as bigger buildings are opening up, especially here on the South End, um, making sure that we are working closely with city officials and the developers of those buildings to get an understanding for what types of families and populations are they expecting to come to their establishments, right? I think by having a better relationship with the building and real estate community, as well as doing more thoughtful communication with other school districts, we'll have a better idea of what the trends are going to be. Um, I think why that question is even more pertinent is that as we are rebuilding schools for their right size capacity, I'm sure a lot of you know that many of the schools on the south and especially our middle schools are overcrowded. And with that, when we are building the right size capacity schools, it's going to be less <laughs> space than what folks are used to, which makes that question even more critical because we're going to have to get really creative with the solutions. And that means boundary changes that are probably going to be coming up in the near future. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Great question. Very much. All right. Now we're going to go on to question number four, and I believe that was Andy. Hi. Yes. Thank you, Chair Gomez. Um, do you support SPS continuing option schools? And if so, do you support continued transportation for K through eight students to option schools? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. I think we need to like parse that out, right? I think that there are some option schools that provide really equitable experiences for their students. I think that there are also some option schools that are the bastions of white privilege and that are utilized for uh, families to have more access to specific learning environments for their students. So it's not really, a, again, a one size fits all question. Do I support option schools? Yes, if they're getting results for their students and they're doing a great job of serving them and they can prove and show that, you know, they have a commitment to equity, then of course. Course, right? But if there are option schools that exist within our system that are being um, 
disproportionately enrolled by white families that might not necessarily have the same equity concerns as families that, you know, in my part of the district and in the north end of the city, I think evaluating what resources we pump into which schools and when is a really good thing for a district our size to do, because if we don't prioritize, then we end up throwing money every which way, and that doesn't necessarily serve anyone. So I think moving forward, we need to get really clear about what the expectations for option schools are to ensure that while we're doing something really great in the name of equity, we're not, we're also not perpetuating the privilege that is very present within our district. I think that I would support a transportation option that prioritizes the needs of students furthest away from educational justice, which currently it does not. And so that will likely mean that there will be changes, right? But changes don't always mean that everybody loses out or that there's a specific population of student who is not going to have a ride to school. What I think we do need to do is get really serious about what are our priorities and how can we create sustainable change moving forward to ensure all kids have the resources they need to thrive. I think one more thing that I would say about that is that when we're having a conversation about transportation, we also have to take into consideration that many of our bus drivers are not returning to drive buses because they have found better opportunities, as well as the state's funding formula for transportation oftentimes leaves us footing the bill and that number will only get higher as time goes on. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, and now we're going to move into our follow up questions and uh, the responses to those are one minute apiece and we'll start with Paula. Thank you, Chair Gomez and thank you for being here. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned privilege and I would love your take on the uh, technology infrastructure gaps, yeah. particularly as we can all contemplate a return to some hybrid learning environment It was Delta runs rampant. Um, think about technology and, and addressing the privilege concerns and the equity challenges. Certainly, I think it's absolutely ridiculous that it took a pandemic for us to get to one-to-one -to -one devices. I think that folks will come and say what they will about screen time, but in a place like Seattle, where we profess to be one of the tech hubs of the world, it, it's silly that Seattle Public Schools has taken this long to get here. I think part of technology infrastructure is also technology education, and not only for our students, but for our educators, right? I don't think we necessarily have a lack of technology in our buildings, right? We have a lack of really fast and really you know up-to-date technology, but what the bigger DARF is, is where we have so much technology and so many resources at the hands of our educators and our students, but we're not really teaching them how to use it effectively. So I think a digital citizenship uh, program is really important, as well as utilizing our partnerships with folks like Microsoft, Amazon, what have you, to actually come into classrooms and uh, share with the students how to make the most out of technology, because I don't think we're doing a great job of it right now. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, any other follow-up questions? Uh, yes, I have one. Okay. Yeah. Um, how will you measure your impact or success if you are elected um, to the school board? That is a great question. So as a teacher, I know that the only way that we are going to be able to determine whether we reached our goal or not is if we have very clear metrics. And so under the leadership of President Hampson and myself, we are transitioning to what is called a student-focused governance model. This is this is uh, lifted up by the Council of Great City Schools. Um, you can do research on that organization. They're fantastic. But what it really does is takes the adults out of all of the conversations that we have and really focuses our system on what our students know and what they can do. And what that looks like is more assessment, but not more standardized testing. I think what we need is to be able to check in and understand more than just at the beginning and the end of the year of where our students are and what they can do and tie our metrics to how we are measuring ourselves on performance to those things. So very soon you will see a goal focused around literacy, numeracy, and college uh, readiness and graduation that will be coming forth with very clear metrics that are directly tied to our strategic plan, which wasn't present before. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, for sure. Any further follow-ups? This is my favorite thing to do, y'all. So please, any questions? <laughs> I can tell. I can any tell. Any questions? I, I, I have one that was asked. A teacher, a true teacher. <laughs> <laughs> yes. I have a question that was asked by one of our members, um, yeah. and it has to do with rapid testing um, yeah. in, uh, each week. Uh, mm -hmm. I guess LA Unified School District is um, leading the nation on this right now, and mm -hmm. they were wondering if... Uh, 
if you could respond to that. Yeah, there will be testing. I don't know what the, um, and it will be rapid. I just don't know how often we're going to do it, right? Because standards and what King County Public Health, the information that we're getting from them changes on what feels like an hourly basis. And so as soon as we get buildings open and I have a clear understanding of like where we are with supply and all those types of things, then I'll have a better answer for you. I think that what I would say is that we are very committed to regular testing. What I could not quote for you here today is how often we're gonna do that, but we will be implementing it at every school school building, as well as vaccination sites when it becomes available for, you know, folks under 12, we will be very strategic and are already putting plans into place to lift up vaccination sites as well. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, Ethan, go ahead. Kind of a bigger, broader question, but what, what yeah. in your mind is kind of the biggest obstacle or biggest challenge facing Seattle schools right now? <laughs> finding a superintendent that can last more than 20 minutes. I think that like what we need is, you know, someone who understands the Seattle process and can navigate that. I think what we didn't have in our previous superintendent is a strong operational leader. Superintendent Juno was fantastic in terms of vision and helping us really articulate what our commitments to students furthest away from educational justice and black boys should be. I think what I'm really excited about Dr. Jones is that he brings operational expertise from not only the school district, but from Metro. And if you look at the folks that he's hired, I, I got to tell you, it's night and day in terms of just operational expertise and experience and how to get the organization moving. I think on top of that, I worry a lot about uh, special education and how we are going to continue to pay for that. I think that it's the right thing to do. Um, but what we need to get really clear about is that, you know, as more people move to our district to take advantage of those services, that is literally taken from the general fund and what we're able to offer to all of our students. And so someone is going to have to foot the bill for that and it's not going to be a levy so the my we're gonna to have to go to the state <laughs> thank you yeah for sure great question andy go ahead um i've got two questions so i guess i'll just ask them one one oh, should we'll be quick it. um yeah. what are the top three essential qualities of a successful board member yeah. Wow. What a good question. I think first, uh, and this is very biased, but um, education in, or excuse me, experience in a K-12 school uh, that goes beyond being a parent, uh, because what I have noticed, and this is not just uh, iterative for Seattle, but for other districts as well, is that oftentimes you'll have single issue board directors that get onto the board to fix a problem for their kid, and then they just don't know what else they want to do, right? So in order for us to be effective, we need people who deeply care and understand the educational system. I think other qualities are compassion and a real understanding for what community engagement and equity is. Equity has become one of the most perverted words, especially here in Seattle, because white people have gotten really good at the lingo and patting themselves on the back when they say a couple of words really pretty. Um, the problem with that, though, is that that creates our own echo chamber. And so it gets to a point to where we aren't making the advancements that we want, because as I don't have to tell y'all, Seattle being one of the most intellectual cities in the world, we get so caught up in conversation and jargon, but action just doesn't happen, right? So those would be some of the qualities that I would like to see in colleagues of mine on the school board and what I try to bring forward to the board as well. Great. Thank you. Uh, do you want to ask your second question, Andy? Uh, yes, please. Um, what is the most valuable lesson that you've learned in your journey to where you are now? Ooh, man, y'all are coming <laughs> with the heaters. Oh my goodness. Um, so one of the best lessons actually came from a good friend of mine named Jason Clark. He works with uh, Credible Messengers um, and many other organizations across the city. And it was just all about community engagement and putting community and specifically students in the driver's seat for policy and getting out of the way as much as possible. I think where elected officials really screw up is that, you know, I, I'm a, as a Harry S. Truman scholar, one of, you know, and I do not support all the decisions that Truman made, but one um, quote that he had really stuck with me is that you would be very surprised what we're able to get done if no one cares who gets the credit. And one of the biggest things that I have experienced, especially in politics here in Seattle, is that folks care a lot about who gets the credit. So much so that things will get halted if folks do not feel as though they are adequate represented in the credit for the work. That is incredibly frustrating to the point to where, you know, it, it brings me to really think about like, okay, how do I build relationships in an effective way moving forward? 
And so to answer your question, I think the biggest, most valuable lesson I've learned is that it's not about me. I frankly don't care if I, my name gets put on some policy or building or whatever. As long as we are getting it done for kids, then that's what matters. And the credit should go to the community because they have had these ideas that we're just now acting on for decades. And so they are the ones that are really doing the work. And we are doing our jobs as public servants, putting them in the leadership positions and driver's seat to make this stuff happen. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. And with that, we'll ask you to go ahead and give a one minute wrap up. Yo, this was a great conversation. I am so excited to speak with y'all. Um, what I would say is that if you're looking for a board director that's got experience directly in the classroom and that has been born and bred into a family of educators who understands the needs of our families, especially those furthest away from educational justice, but also who is prepared to sit in community and listen in order to find the best results and pathways forward for our children. And just frankly, a board director who cares about kids, then I hope that I've earned your vote. And I hope that I will will be able to work with y'all moving forward, even past this election. Uh, one of the things that folks really often forget is that as board directors, we represent the entire city and we do not do a good enough job of showing up in parts of the city outside of our own district. So I look forward to working specifically with y'all and others, but I am just so excited about what this next year is going to bring for Seattle Public Schools. And I just hope that I continue to be a part of it. Great. Thank you so much.